Okay, everybody, so um, we are now on the W's. Uh, we finally reached the W's. So the, the uh, first speaker today is going to be Elal Wiseman, um, who's from Goldsmith, University of London, but is also next year at Princeton. So great, uh, Elal. Thank you. I'm absolutely grateful to share a letter with you, Mark. And also, um, I, I have to say that it was, it's particularly uh, honor and pleasure and wonderful to be here because it was here 11 years ago that uh, Mark has uh, invited Rafi and I to give our first talk uh, after we got into trouble, so to say, with, uh, uh, with the Israeli Association of Architects. So I feel, I, you know, I feel kind of the support uh, uh, in, our, in our back. Um, you know, we were speaking about theory and practice, and I'd like to speak about, uh, rather than kind of foreground architecture here, about aesthetic practice that is always Thinking of the problem through aesthetics is always simultaneously both theory and practice. But for me, more importantly, it holds a certain intersection between, sorry, is that like? The mic, was not working? Okay, no, I think, I think it's fine. I, I hear my echoes. Um, so the, the work that I will present is really at the intersection of the aesthetics and the political, or aesthetic and political practice. And I think really the, it is in the aesthetics that those three terms meet, theory, practice, and politics. In relation to the urgencies of architectural theory, I will be speaking here briefly from a growing archive of the Forensic Architecture Project that I think might respond to the aim of this gathering, because it emerged out of a question, at least in the way that I've posed it to myself, of how architectural intelligence could intervene in the world and perform in different forums. Forensics, which is both research, uh, the science of research, it has a field dimension to it, but also, of course, its presentation. These are two separate but entangled forms of practice. Um, and it's also a kind of, uh, for me, brought me into very close material interrogation, almost at the, kind of, at the most intimate level of uh, intimacy with matter, with the texture of architecture, but of architecture that had to be defined as a media form. So I'll show today one of 25 cases. Um, uh, in. Um, most of them are presented in Berlin now in a big exhibition called Forensis at the House of World Culture. Uh, it's a result of a very large and generous grant uh, from the EU, and um, with that money, I have transformed more or less the Center for Research Architecture that I run at Goldsmiths into a forensic agency. But rather than being a forensic agency that uh, employs scientists, uh, we did it with artists and architects. And, and the kind of the challenge was to see what we could bring into investigations. Uh, initially, we had not much work, um, and gradually practicing through architecture, the kind of the art of forensics, uh, led to increasing kind of flow of commissions. And the one I'm going to speak about today is our commission uh, for the UN that was presented here in New York at the General Assembly uh, several months ago. Um, on um, the analysis, which is effectively one of the biggest quote-unquote murder investigations going on now, uh, and this is the drone warfare investigation of the UN uh, in five countries, in Pakistan, Afghanistan, Somalia, Yemen, uh, and Gaza. But we didn't only kind of form the forensic agency as a service provision, we also instituted another, or started another form of critical historical, theoretical research into the very foundations of forensics. Uh, so in a sense, both constructing and, dis and, and questioning the very terms uh, that we were uh, using. Uh, so a lot of our work is actually historical, theoretical. Some of it is kind of propositional or, or uh, to be pre articulated as service uh, to various prosecution teams uh, uh, around the world, mainly uh, in, uh, in the context of war crimes. 
Uh, and those two things were sometimes in contradiction with each other, uh, as I will show you uh, later. So I'll return to the UN investigation of drone, but I want to start with a kind of a vignette from an, a growing research that they do on a particular trial. The new millennium started with a bizarre and rather perverse legal case. The David Irving trial unfolding at the English High Court of Justice in January 2000, as you know, David Irving uh, is one of the very notorious Holocaust deniers. Um, so the trial involved one of the most intense presentations and aggressive cross-interrogations of architectural evidence in any trial that I have seen. The context for the trial was a libel case. In 1996, seeking publicity for his cause, that is Holocaust denial, David Irving sued an American writer and her publisher, that was Penguin, for libel for calling him a Holocaust denial. So in fact, he managed to bring, to force the court to seek for the evidence that uh, the genocide has taken place. I'm particularly interested in two days within this trial. On the 10th and the 11th days uh, of the trial, the discussion revolved largely around the architecture of one of the gas chambers, Crematorium 2 in Auschwitz-Birkenau, which is the only uh, remnant of a building that has survived. Uh, as you know, when the Nazis retreated from Auschwitz in January 45, They've destroyed and buried most others, but they have neglected one it's in, a, in a rush of, uh, of retreat. They've left that, that ruin that has become somehow the kind of the object uh, of debate. In those two days, uh, it's a two days discussion between Irving and an architectural historian called Robert Jan van Pelt, perhaps you know him, who was acting as the expert witness for the defense for uh, Penguin Books, uh, effectively. And they were going uh, over an enormous amount of architectural drawings and architectural elements and kind of arguing, cross-interrogating, uh, very, very minute uh, details within it. But the main claim uh, was, uh, of Irving was that something in that ruin was missing. And these were four holes that uh, witnesses, both perpetrators and victims that survived the war, testified that they've seen the Nazis pouring the Cyclone B cyanide through four holes in the ceiling. The problem was, as also Van Pelt uh, explained in the court, that those four holes did not exist anymore. The ruin was there, but the holes uh, were missing. According, uh, so, so in a sense, Irving claimed was that the whole story rests or falls on the existence of these four holes. Those four holes are the weapon of the destruction. Without the gun, you cannot convict. So, in fact, what he has done is that he has positioned matter against memory, right? So, matter was used in order to prove that the memory of survivors, uh, both, w again, both victims and perpetrators, uh, were, was deluded, obscured, or that they were trying to manipulate uh, history in that sense. That was captured by the devilish formulation of a man called Robert Faurisson, who said, no holes, no holocaust. I mean, without the holes in the ceiling, the room under it could not function as a gas chamber if the main gas chamber of Auschwitz is not a gas chamber, the whole story of the holocaust. Uh, it does not exist. And he even went further, if that is not the case, the entire political architecture of the post-war period that was conceived as a result of the story uh, of, of what he called the story or the myth of the Holocaust uh, is, uh, is refutable and should collapse like a tower of cards, right? So those holes uh, were holding the kind of the, the UN, uh, uh, sort of the Geneva Convention, other uh, human rights kind of features. It's kind of an incredibly linear uh, logic in it that also is interesting because forensics was not used here in a service of positivism, but in a service of negation. So um, negation in itself is a compounded form of violence. It is a violence against people and things, and it is also a violence against the evidence that violence has taken place. But it, so, 
So this is one uh, of the negationists uh, kind of entering into uh, one of the kind of cracks in, in, that, in that ceiling, trying to demonstrate that it's simply too large to have been the holes uh, that, uh, that they were looking for. Um, however, a piece of evidence did uh, surface in court that was very interesting. It was an aerial photograph taken by Allied Reconnaissance Mission aiming to document the nearby Monovice petrochemical factory on August 25th, 1944. So it was before the, the camp was evacuated. There was a, uh, in fact, that negative was always in the CIA possession, but was never looked at. Uh, people did not interpret that part. The, the bit of the roof uh, in it was in a parallax part of the lens uh, in the, in the, in the uh, aerial uh, image there. However, Harun Faroqi, in his film, Images of the World, an inscription uh, of war uh, in 1998, kind of traces the story of how that film was uh, discovered in 1979. This is the same roof that you've seen before, and on the roof there are indeed four blurs that uh, the CIA annotate as vents leading to the holes. But Irving claimed that the marks could not refer to the holes on the roof because they were simply too large. They had no form. They were formless. They were blurry and suggested that these negatives were tampered with with brush strokes. The negative was sent, in fact, to a specialist uh, called Nevin Bryant, who was a supervisor of the image processing application at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena. So they had the kind of the highest technology to look into uh, the film uh, itself. He's one of the world leader in analysis of aerial and satellite images. After enhancing the image with software program used by NASA for satellite image interpretation, Brian could peer into the molecular level of the film. At this magnification, he could confirm that the blur in the aerial image have been caused by the chemical by a certain chemical reaction that happens on the level of the kind of the molecules when they are exposed to light. The thing that, uh, that happened there, and that he suggested that, that the blur was a result of an interference pattern or a moiré effect that tends to develop when the size of a single salt particle on the film, on the negative itself, is exactly the size of the thing it is there to represent. Right. So the hole was the size of a single civil soul uh, piece. Um, so this is uh, a moment that in forensic terms is in an epistemologically enriched moment. It's called the threshold of detectability. It is exactly when things are between being in and out uh, of focus. In fact, what happened to the silver salt grain, not being able to take the kind of the chemical composition kind of spread and created that moray on the entire on the entire roof. But in at the threshold of detectability, something very important happens. Uh, both the materiality of the roof and the materiality of the film come simultaneously into view. You cannot analyze one without the other. Uh, in fact, it is almost as if one bit of material reality is reflected in another bit of material reality. And each one of them has an architecture uh, in itself and need to be investigated. Of course, when you're above the threshold of detectability, the kind of chemical process of the film matters less. When you cannot see anything, it's only the chemical composition that you can uh, somehow look at. But at the threshold, both come into view. And uh, in fact, this is kind of bringing to mind the kind of the materiality of um, of representation itself. It was not, it, the film and the roof were both bits of matter. They were both presence and representation. Right? So this is something uh, that is very important in, in the story that I will tell you. But if architectural analysis resembles in archeology, span this was not an archeology span of material excavation, but rather an archeology span of the media in which it is captured. But space in itself, the roof in itself, is also a media. It's a media form. Not in a sense that images or photographs of it circulate in the history book or in journal or newspapers, but because the roof itself does three things. It is a sensor, the roof itself. It receives information. 
it stores information in its material composition, and it allows through a process of forensic presentation to disseminate that information further. So that means the roof in itself is like a photograph. Okay, enough about Irving. Irving lost his case, and my aim here is not to open it. What I did want to show, or to start showing, is how forensic architecture operates both as, a, as an analysis of the materiality of the architecture and the materiality of the media in which it is captured. It seems that ours is a period of negation and denial. I found it rather bizarre, though, that when I was looking at climate change denial, somehow that emerged at the very same time, same period as Holocaust denial kind of emerged in the middle of the 80s, um, that it was also busying itself with the existence or non-existence of another whole. Climate change deniers were, of course, obsessed with refuting the existence of the hole in the ozone layer. Through that hole, scientists started explaining lethal radiation would enter the Earth, destroying most forms of life on it. So it seems now that the size of the chamber has become the size of the entire planet. And the size of the hole is the size of the continent of, of the Antarctic. But if climate change is genocide in the making, it, this is certainly an autogenocide. Here, it is the people in the chamber that have opened a hole in the protective ceiling above them. So what is it that attracts deniers to holes? Irving words to the judge presiding over his case might initially support a metaphorical reading why they are interested in holes. He said to the judge, I'm going to keep on driving holes in this case until your lordship appreciates the significance of the holes or their absence. In both the Irving and the Usenhol case, the claims of deniers is however more complex, since in their mind, the evidence for the little hole was absent, and given that the hole is non-matter, what we have faced here is an absence of an absence, a, the absence of a whole. And, um, and of course, the model, what the, the, uh, if in the Irving case, what we are looking at is, a, is an aerial shot, what we are looking at at the image of um, uh, the Earth is a model. It's another form of an image that is a mathematical construct. It's not a it is not a photograph. It is uh, produced uh, by uh, models. <coughs> However, as Henry Bergson already noted, a hole is more, not less, information than the matter that surrounds it. In our case, be it reinforced concrete or the ozone hole. And this is because a hole is two things. It is both the materiality of the thing perforated, ozone or concrete, and its absence. Um, so, in a sense, in the case of the, um, the model, it is not an image of thing past, like a photograph, but a model of a possible future reality. Right? There's a kind of an inversion of time. The model calculates is uh, a possible reality. We're speaking about forensics of a damage that has not yet occurred. It's a kind of uh, forensic future, if you like. When speaking about forensics of the future, a destruction yet to come, another strange connection emerged. And you'll forgive me for making like huge jumps. This is part of a you know, uh, notes from a very long uh, text. That between environmental issues, the future destruction that might be brought about by climate change, and another field that is currently obsessed with future prediction, and that is the kind of the war on terror calculus that is being applied now uh, in the context of drone warfare, for example. But how a trace of a crime that has not yet happened looks like. I mean, in fact, you know that uh, the Americans, according to uh, the US regulation on the security apparatus here, uh, uh, by drones, uh, America, or, or kind of drone operators, are allowed to kill, to target a person, never for what he has done, she has done, rarely she, uh, but what they will have done, uh, 
to, uh, it can never be a punishment. It is always a kind of a, a response to an imminent threat. A, it's a response to a crime that has not yet happened. And I think somehow that kind of forensics of the future, which is really where most forensic practices are going towards, is something perhaps to comment on the kind of the urgencies of architectural theory. What does it mean to do a forensic of future events? So the futurology of contemporary warfare, look for such traces, and this on the right is our attempt to kind of from the media to uh, compose the chain of action that would allow a kind of a calculation also based on models, on prediction, on pattern uh, of behavior, pattern of movement in space to predict that somebody is uh, uh, posing a threat or is about uh, to conduct something. Okay, I, I have to skip uh, on. So forensic architecture in a group uh, that included Susan Shupley, Stefan Kramer, Jacob Burns, and CITU research here, were commissioned by the UN to research the damage undertaken by drone warfare in Pakistan. Uh, and in fact, the only evidence for that when you are not allowed to enter Pakistan uh, and all the areas where drone warfare operates are frontier zones and are under siege. In fact, that's the condition for uh, drone warfare uh, to happen, is that those zones are inaccessible. If they are accessible, at least legally, the American would have to go and arrest the person. Um, so it, it is entering, it's a kind of a, a forensics that we were asked to do, which somehow mirrored the remoteness of the operator uh, themselves working only on kind of fragments uh, of media uh, that are coming. So in a sense, just to say that the drone is not, as they say, it's a, a weapon of the future, but is a, it is a kind of weapon aiming at the future, aiming to intervene in the future. Drones operate through two uh, complementary kind of acts. On the one hand, an increasing field of visibility, to the attacking force, and a reduction of visibility uh, to those monitoring it. So the siege over uh, Pakistan is, uh, uh, in fact, so we, we, we tend to think of drone warfare as simply a direct line between the machine and the target. But in fact, it relies on great territorial arrangement and the siege that does not allow cameras to come in and out and does not allow any uh, internet connection, for example, or other means uh, of evidence to come out of Pakistan. So it's a, creating a visual black box while heightening the field of visibility in it. So you would share my surprise that when we started doing this work for the UN, what we found as evidence mainly is that holes in ceilings. Most drone attacks target now buildings, but they do not destroy buildings. They try not to destroy buildings that would supposedly increase the level of casualties. The way a Hellfire missile operates is with a delay fuse, because if it would hit the, the roof and blast, the entire building would collapse. Those fragments of a second delay allow it to penetrate through the roof and spread a little load within the room itself. So wherever you are looking at drone warfare, you always see holes in the ceiling. The hole in the ceiling is the evidence that that room under it has become an execution room or that people uh, has died in it. Some of those holes are incredibly small and this is in Gaza um, and something that we did have, uh, uh, some of our researchers had access to. Sometimes they can penetrate through two layers. Now, you, the UN does its forensics, and this is, was the limitation and why they asked us through satellite images. This is also something that here in this school we've learned uh, from Laura Kurgan's uh, research, uh, really path-breaking research, on satellite uh, images. But there is a problem in the publicly available satellite images, and that is that the size of a pixel is legally reduced to 50 centimeters by 50 centimeters. A 50 centimeters by 50 centimeters is the size of the human body. Uh, of course, for privacy reasons, the image 
uh, the satellite image stamps out a human. So people cannot sue upwards uh, uh, the satellite uh, company. But the size of the hole is about 30 centimeters, i.e. we are exactly at the same point. It's not, a very, it's not an analogous political situation. Nobody says that targeting individuals in, in Pakistan is like exterminating uh, people in, in a gas chamber. But the forensic problem remains. The size of the missiles is under the threshold of detectability of the image uh, itself. The violation is at the threshold of visibility. Again, we need to analyze the politics of the image and or the image, the materiality of the image and the materiality of the roof simultaneously. So the pixel is not only the threshold of vision, it is also the threshold of the law. When the figure dissolves into the ground of the image, it is the condition, legal, political, and technical, that degrade the image to that 50 centimeters it becomes important. For example, uh, Israel is lobbied with the US, and it's the only country in the world where the size of a pixel is 2.5 centimeters. That is, the size of a car, rather than the size of a person. A building is 9 pixels, or 16 pixels. Of course, after the flotilla event, Turkey has now sent a satellite into space precisely in order to break that kind of threshold of visibility over Israel and the occupied territories, showing you that geopolitics of pixelation uh, is very important. So it is a kind of a strange uh, throwback to the problem that uh, led to the emergence of before and after images uh, in the 19th century. Uh, Thiebaud famous kind of first image of war before and after of a barricade storming in 1848 where the, the, the before and after was necessary because people were simply moving too fast for the time that it would take the daguerreotype to register people. Again, figure dissolves into ground. The kind of the, the image, the, the, the human event turns into the event of architecture that is bookmarked by two states, a kind of an archaeology of an image again. That is exactly the state where we are now when we interpret politics in a kind of through this montage of satellite images that also stamp out people but show that the kind of the interpretation uh, is uh, in the difference in the built fabric. Again, I, I, uh, I recommend highly uh, Laura Kurgan's book uh, on that. But what happens when in the before and the after, and we know that that building was targeted in Pakistan, you see nothing before and after, before and after. The, the size of the hole is actually missing. Now this allows another form of negation that is now formulated by the US. It's officially sanctioned the Glomer response because the Glomer was a boat that the CIA wanted to hide. And it's a kind of negation that unlike climate change negation or even Holocaust negation, does not seek to add any alternative story uh, to history. It's not an epistemological intervention. It seeks to be an epistemological zero, zero. It, the formulation is that the US neither confirms nor deny the existence or non-existence of drone warfare in Pakistan. But the Glomer response is not only a rhetorical condition, it's a condition of images, and it's a territorial condition that allows uh, that form of negation. So working on the frontiers of forensics, within forensics, is working at the frontier of the image, at the level of the pixel. Forensics 101 since Bertillon is that the police, that is the state, must see in higher resolution than the subject. But in our counter forensics, that is individual policing on the state rather than state policing on individuals, we always in a position of an epistemological inferiority. They kill in three millimeter pixel and we analyze in half a meter pixel. That is the space and the politics of denial uh, within that. So I will at, at now unpack, if I have time, two uh, uh, strategies that we have used in order to bypass and invert again a uh, kind of counter forensics of the image. In the summer of 2012, a short bit of footage, 22 seconds, was smuggled, six hands, past six hands, and arrived from Waziristan 
went its way through the siege into Islamabad and landed in the office of uh, NBC uh, there. It was a rare piece of footage uh, that um, um, uh, was um, broadcasted. Uh, so the, the, the 22 seconds were screened by, uh, uh, and I'll show you in fact uh, all um, uh, 22 seconds of it. I'll, I'll, I'll cut the sound. Uh, because in fact when it was there also very disturbingly a lot of information was put on the image uh, and there was no attempt to see anything in it. It's simply a confirmation that something has happened. We see destruction. We see a hole in the roof. Uh, we see a building destroyed. Uh, etc. And that's it. But looking at the image frame by frame means that, uh, and for us we took half a year of looking at this 22 seconds, we're starting seeing things. And both Bernard and Mark Cousins were speaking about the window. And it was initially not what we see through the window, but the window frame itself that gave us the most important information. The size of uh, the frame within, or the window frame, within the photographic frame, meant that the person is not at the window. The person shooting it is inside the room. The person shooting it is perhaps feeling danger, whether it is a sense of danger from a second US strike or from Taliban, uh, we do not know. But that means that that is a kind of a precious evidence delivered under perilous circumstances. Uh, again, the kind of the, uh, that idea. Now, I, I, um, do I need to hurry up? Um, okay. Uh, I'll, I'll skip though a little bit. So we were, we were analyzing uh, image by image and we wanted to find the only confirmed target site uh, in Waziristan that we know, um, that, that, that we can tell. It was, our task was first to know where that building is in the entire North, South, Waziristan. Uh, what we could see first is that the shadow is cast forward, north by northwest, i.e. We, 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 we are looking northwards. Uh, we can see that we are, there's a building, the building from which the photograph is taken is higher than the building destroyed. So we know we have a higher building behind the lower building. And then we uh, kind of collage all those images together. We get a, a full view. Uh, of the ruin, and now it's, uh, we're looking for some features within that image. We see a bend in the road on the left, and we see a certain widening of the road on the right. Uh, and uh, so that is initially the kind of typology uh, we're looking for as we're scanning through the cities of Waziristan, trying to find a building that has a high building behind, uh, and that kind of form of streets in front. Um, we are kind of thinking that it might be uh, this, and we start a comparison. We see a fanning beams on the left. We see a kind of a fan of beam uh, on the ruin itself. Uh, then we are looking at uh, the tower. There's a higher building, and we can confirm we see a higher building on the satellite image. Uh, we see a higher building also on the left. It's a very laborious process. Sorry for kind of taking you. Uh, through, all, uh, through all the details. So we, we're pretty certain that we found the building um, um, between the satellite image. Now we know where the target uh, is. Uh, sorry. So, you know, we're looking at the, at, at the satellite image that is available, but of course, uh, kind of the, the, the problem of pixelation means that uh, we can simply not know within which pixel the drone rocket has entered and therefore which room. So we want to even find the room uh, where it happened. It's one of those pixels, uh, we think. So, um, where are we? Okay, let's skip a little bit too. So we, we, we're looking at the shadow. Uh, again, very laborious process. You kind of compare the length of the shadow to the length of the building, uh, and we can build a 3D model of the building that we suspect is the building uh, that was destroyed. We locate it within an extruded map uh, of the city. And now it is important to know what time the video uh, was taken. So that is obviously very easy for uh, in kind of existing architectural software. We take that ruin 
we have some shots of the shadow, uh, and if that indeed is the building, we're running the shadow on the ruin until uh, we find the, the kind of, we match the, the, the images, the frames, and the shadow. And that becomes very important later because we have a ray of light entering through the hole in the ceiling, uh, as you would see. So of course, there is also the interior of the building. So we, not, we try to locate now that room uh, within the building. We can see some cracks. Uh, we do the same thing uh, for the interior. Oops, sorry. Um, and we have through now the light entering through the hole in the ceiling, we have a direction, we use it as a compass around which we locate, we turn the room and we find the location of the room, uh, sorry, the location of the room within the building. Now, um, we're looking, you know, we're seeing some hands, this is inside, so people are feeling a bit more protected, you see some humans uh, in there, and we see that fragments, and we need to, in order to make it an evidence, we need to show that that fragment is at least formally similar to fragments that we find in the office of Shazar Akbar in, uh, in Pakistan, in, uh, in Islamabad. But actually more interesting is behind it we see holes, a kind of chips, a kind of fragments on the roof, or on the wall itself. So we start mapping very, very carefully all those fragment holes that we find. And we mark, we scan the image and we find all of them, speaking about kind of patterns uh, in the room. So this is where the missile has entered. These are the kind of shrapnel uh, on the wall. But what we notice slowly is this, that there are two areas in which there are less fragments. In those areas where there are less fragments, we think might be the way bodies uh, stood. The bodies absorbed the, the, the thing, and therefore, uh, in a sense, what we have is that the wall has become some kind of media, some kind of photograph, uh, and, um, and on, on which the bodies uh, were imprinted. Uh, so here, the kind of pathology and architecture enters through the kind of the aesthetics of the wall itself, through a kind of an analysis both of the materiality of the wall as a media form and the media in which it is represented. Uh, the second example that I want to show if I have another five minutes or two, two, I'll do two, uh, was to do with uh, a witness that uh, has escaped uh, from Waziristan. And she managed to escape because she had a German passport. So a European passport allowed her to, to come. And she went to Europe and her husband was facing trial and she was wanting to uh, kind of deliver testimony. But the problem was that she has forgotten, she, she, uh, she was in a house that was attacked by drones, but she forgotten the, uh, the attack itself. Uh, of course, people do tend to, for, you know, uh, trauma, tra the kind of the effect of trauma on memory on people that effectively suffer the worst day of their life uh, uh, is happening like that. So uh, what we have done is a very slow process of building the house in which she was living uh, she was building a model. She was not an architect, but uh, there was an, archite an, an architect next to her that anything that she has remembered has built and modeled, and slowly through the kind of conjunction of architecture and the details, the memory came back. I will show you uh, uh, some uh, short clip uh, from it. Let me skip. Aber so den Grundriss hatte ich immer im Kopf gehabt. Ich habe ja auch länger da gelebt, Tag und Nacht. Und hier war auch wieder so ein riesen, so ein riesen schwerer Eisentür, genau wie auf der anderen Seite. Ne? Richtig, ja. ja. Ich würde es etwas weiter machen. Okay. Ja, das ist okay. <lacht> Stopp. Ich erinnere mich gerade. Die Tür war weiter hier und das Fenster war auf der Seite. Okay. Mhm. Das ist einfach, genau. Kann ich, kann ich das einmal von oben sehen? Genau. Dann kann ich das besser. Ja. Ja. Mir hilft diese Visualisierung, um sich mehr daran zu erinnern, was passiert ist vor jetzt knapp zweieinhalb Jahren. 
Also es hat mir schon sehr viel geholfen, muss ich sagen. Mhm. Für also ohne den Grundriss wäre ich nicht darauf gekommen. Ja. So, ja. Also das sind verschiedene Sachen. Ne? Okay. Mhm. Das würde ich mal einfach mal. Das Bett? Ja, hatten wir im Hof stehen. Damals halt. Mhm. So. Ja, ich würde es mal weiter an die Tür rücken. Ja, so. Mhm. Okay. Um, what was, uh, I mean, the film goes on and on, and you can see her starting to remember as, um, as, a, as a process of conceiving kind of the syntax and the objects, uh, an object in every room kind of bring the memory. But there was one thing that was particularly uh, interesting for us, and that was the witness who chooses to remain anonymous, therefore I do not refer to her in name, uh, was her obsession with the fan. In the beginning we thought it was, the fact she was very hot there or something like that. Uh, but she was continuously moving the fan around and never was always uneasy about it. And later when we reconstructed the strike uh, itself, she has remembered, uh, and that was kind of the most <coughs> traumatic memory for her, that she found human flesh on the fan uh, itself. So the fan was also a certain kind of media form uh, in which, you know, kind of it stores memory in a perhaps related, or if not similar way to the kind of art of memory fantasiate idea that herself in her theory starts with a kind of a, a collapsed building, no? The intersection of memory and architecture happens at the point of, of architectural destruction. So these are not hard evidence, what I've showed you today. Um, the courts and, and the process that we have made was not a juridical process, this is a UN investigation. But still they are weak signals, faint memories, speculations, probabilities that exist at the threshold of visibility and also at the threshold of the law because we do not know if they would be admitted uh, as evidence or they simply do not have an evidentiary value until we do not test it. In course, that those things do not exist a priori. So still these signals being under the threshold of science and of the law make the pr practice of forensics uh, potentially in excess, I think, of both science and the law and connects it to that kind of intersection of aesthetics politics, uh, you know, through theory and practice. Thank you for listening. I go, I go. I was saying earlier that I'm fond of everybody that's speaking today, um, but there is an exception. Um, <laughs> So, so, um, so these would be some, some notes, like the beginning of an argument, a kind of proto-argument that um, could have, or maybe even does have, the title Flash Theory. So the question um, I asked, that I ask of myself, uh, along with my friends, is, you know, what are the urgencies of architectural theory using 2000 as a reference point? That is to say, what are the urgencies for architectural theory in the 21st century, which is also, of course, the question, what have they been for the last 14 years? So somehow looking back and forward at the same time. I would say a more or less standard narrative is that there was a wave of theory. I don't know if wave is the right, it's a bit California, but a, a, a wave of theory um, in quotation marks uh, in mid 80s to late 90s that was explicitly based uh, on 70s theory, particularly in the United States, but also on a total rejection of the mode of that theory. So I think there's a very clear, um, um, there was quite a lot of blood on the floor, you know, dead parents and all of that, uh, which gave way to the 21st century without so much theory. Hence the typical questions, what happened to theory, what comes after theory, um, etc., accompanied by the usual uh, hypocrisies of anti-theory theorists um, which are, in fact, quite reassuring. And I think uh, in moments of doubt, um, crisis, and so on, you can be pretty sure that there's some anti-theorists theorists, um, 
kind of, as it were, keeping the music playing. Um, they're a bit confused right now because they now, all of them, run schools of architecture. So they haven't quite yet, um, and they're definitely not interested in a kind of memory project that would remind them of what they were saying over the last 10 years. Now, it would be, it would be tempting to, to say, like in answer to the question, what happened to theory, that actually theory actually became so widespread that people don't see it. Um, or another way of saying that is that there are theorists are everywhere you look, so you don't notice them. Or another way of saying the same thing, that theory became industrialized. Um, or that theory triggered such significant transformations of architectural discourse that it became environmental. So theory is now sort of Im Im embedded within, arch within architectural discourse rather than a version of it. Or that new, more stealthy modes of theory were developed to, as it were, continue the theoretical project. I think all of these are the case. I mean, I would make an argument for that. But I don't think the question is worth answering in that form because it's based on, on such a symptomatic misunderstanding about architectural theory. Um, so let's, I mean, try to be um, less um, stupid. Uh, the conventional sense of architectural theory is a kind of combination of a metaphysical explanation, uh, why, why architecture, what architecture, and a physical instrumentalization. So there's a kind of uh, uh, appeal to, to a sort of higher order theory by way of explanation and an activation and mobilization of that appeal in, in the instrumental sphere, which leads to the con conventional sense of architectural theory being a set of statements about what could, should, or should not happen in architecture based on a defense of the very idea of architecture. That is to say, architectural theory is a kind of blurring of inscription, description, and prescription. And I think one could make an argument with a little bit more time that that would be true of all forms of theory, that you can't, in a kind of performance act, you can't simply in instrumentally prescribe without uh, a gesture of metaphysical defense, nor a gesture which appears to be neither a gesture of description. So it's possible that inscription, description, and prescription are a kind of, as it were, requirements of any kind of theory act. But I do think, and this may be a kind of narcissism, a reverse narcissism, that architects spend more time on the metaphysical defense of the idea of architecture than almost any other species I know. There is no act I know of in architectural discourse in all of its dimensions, theoretical, practical, and otherwise, that doesn't involve a somewhat plaintive defense of the idea of the architect. Uh, plumbers tend not to offer you um, a theory as to why plumbing is really important uh, before they carry out their acts. Uh, no architect, even at the top of the tree, is able to say anything about architecture without sort of pleading that the person they're talking to would agree with them that architecture is a good idea. This is particularly the case in the United States where architecture is clearly not a good idea. Um, hence the somewhat remarkably courageous decision, decision of our students not to become plumbers, uh, that is to say be paid, have weekends, have a life, and to become architects. I should note, by the way, that this school of architecture when it was originally formed was uh, connected to the school of mines and sanitary engineering. And had we, if we had maintained that intimate relationship with sanitary engineering, one would actually be able to uh, make these metaphysical arguments and be paid uh, uh, at the same time. But one in a series of mistakes made by the school, uh, of which I'm only the most recent, the, the, the uh, disconnection from sanitary engineering and from the possibility of, of as it were, practice without theory um, uh, uh, seems to me a mistake. Now this, this, this series of statements about what could, should, or should not happen, which are built on uh, a defense of the idea of architecture and what appears to be a description, which actually mediates the two, is usually understood in relationship to the future. Uh, and it's usually opposed to a sense of history understood to be in relationship to the past. The future of the built environment or the future of cities, and I should say our cities, since the word city is just simply a word for whatever it is that allows us to live together. It's not a description of a form, but a, a kind of a set of relationships. Probably the question, what is the future of, of our cities, uh, is absolutely urgent, maybe the most urgent of questions, and certainly massively unclear, and therefore inv inviting uh, answers. 
but, it, but in, a, in a sort of a series of sort of fortune cookie comments that, that will, um, if I say them quickly enough, will sound like a coherent talk. The first of such uh, fortune cookie statements would be the urgencies of theory don't necessarily co coincide with the agreed upon urgencies of the planet. What would be urgent for theory would not be what would be commonly agreed upon to be urgent. Theory is neither about the general concepts organizing contemporary discourse like globalization, sustainability, density, the right to the city, access, transparency, human rights, all of these things that are understood to be urgently important, nor is it about the urgently important specific concepts within architecture, parametric design, regionalism, data, software, new materials, and so on. All of these, as it were, orthodoxies uh, or, or, or sort of um, motifs around which discourse gathers, these would not be the concerns or would not in any way be urgent for theory. The urgency for theory would be precisely be about what is not agreed upon, or what is not yet seen, uh, would, would be the, 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 the role. That is to say, theory uh, in that sense is not about what might or should or should not happen in the future, but much more about the very idea of the future as itself being a theoretical act. In other words, framing the discourse around what, what's a possible uh, future. So not by chance, of course, as Felicity pointed out, 2000 plus is the title of John McHale's 1967 special issue of ID, which launched his Future of the Future research, which became a book in 1969, which was, of course, about the history of the future, um, and therefore the possible future of the future. So the question about theory is not so much about what is the urgent future today, but more about what's happening with the idea of future today. Like, what's cooking with urgency? Like, what's going on in urgency? The future is, of course, uh, although I would always warn my students that anyone who says, of course, is in deep trouble. Uh, it, the, the future is, of course, never simple. That raises the possibility that it is. Uh, but I'm saying, uh, of course, somewhat pathetically, never simple, never simply in front of us, I mean, never simply rushing towards it or we towards it. These are the, and the, the standard sort of metaphors. If anything, the future is, from the beginning and always, a historical artifact. There is, of course, no, th of course, no theory without history and vice versa. One, one could not even uh, imagine this. In fact, theory might even be a word for a certain kind of vibration between a possible past and a possible future. And it might be that history is another form of, of, of vibration, maybe even radically different. But they have in common the two sides with the present being by definition the least knowable thing of all. In fact, theory in that sense might be a way to deal with the profound strangeness or otherness of the present. In the case of architecture, the absolute uh, weirdness it is to be, as it were, uh, in front of or inside a building. In this sense, the urgencies of architectural theory is also equally about the urgencies of history, uh, or more precisely about prehistory. And prehistory might be what is urgent in any one moment. That is to say, what is the story you're telling about the past that would position you in a certain place to make some kind of conjecture about the future? In other words, what, what is the prehistory that would allow one, and that's maybe what prehistory is, to project, to throw, to conjecture? Like, what is the platform from which you make that uh, 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 statement? And the platform cannot be, would never be the present. Um, if the prison could in any way operate as a platform, you wouldn't throw. Uh, you throw yourself, as it were, away from uh, the, the, the trauma of, of, of the prison. So any uh, explicit claim about what could, should, or should not happen always rests on implicit claims about what has happened, uh, what, or what has even just happened, um, or has just stopped happening. So there's also a kind of uh, memorializing built into even the idea of, of, of the prehistory. Uh, and of course I'm reminded of, of Mark Jasenbeck's uh, brilliant dismissal of the idea of the prehistoric. And I still want to ask him why, if the pre-modern is such a ridiculous idea, he's so scared that we are not occupying it um, as architects. Like why we choose to leave a barren field um, to the others. But the prehistory maybe invokes exactly the same problem that Mark pointed out. But I, I think I'm pretty much obsessed with prehistory as a mode of theorizing, or as actually the, the, the mode of theorizing. Uh, right now, I'm trying to finish, have, have finished, I think, a book on Bucky Fuller and radio, so I'm so happy to hear John's talk. 
which is a kind of prehistory of thought about the architecture of the invisible world that we now live in. We live in with a much greater degree of precision than the so-called architectural world, and yet it is a world that we refuse to talk about because radio seems to insult us in its disinterest in objects. It doesn't even leave a hole. It just passes on through. Uh, and this, this sort of just insulting disinterest in the inertia of objects has led us to not talk about it. Um, Tis, as it were, a kind of a family secret. Uh, but not just to uh, the fact of writing about radio, but to write about Bucky Fuller, and I'm, I'm particularly interested in the idea of the monograph, um, precisely because it's now so discredited, and especially the idea of the intellectual biography. So I'm sort of reassured by um, current PhD students who don't want to do intellectual biographies and don't want to do monographs. I feel like that's now clear enough um, that it's a very exciting genre for me to, to work with. Um, because maybe experiments can only be experiments by occupying the most traditional forms. Um, perhaps uh, we could even start to think of theory writing as a form of occupation, like in that double sense, something that you do but also a place that you occupy. And prehistory, it seems to me, opens up a space for possible action, the retroactive view being the engine of forward movement. So if you feel, feel yourself, if you feel the itch um, to move forward, like look backwards. Um, and actually, the, this is a, a pre-modern uh, concept, actually. Um, but still, all of this is to stay within a pretty conventional understanding of theory, like the way a prehistory could release new potentials reconfiguring or producing the very sense of urgency, because that's what the prehistory would do, construct a sense of urgency, is but one obvious example of a much wider and I think less obvious theoretical operation. So, so far I would um, forget everything I've told you so far as yet another form of stupidity. And in as much as the university is a stupidity reduction machine, uh, saving time in that sense, uh, let's try again a little bit more into the fortune cookie. Theory is implied in all architectural discourse in as much as it's architectural discourse. Um, there's no architecture without theory. Um, but theory here is not a description, analysis, explanation, or prescription for architecture. For example, Alberti's 10 books on architecture might be theory, but it's not all theory, nor is his book any more theoretical than any other document in the field. Uh, there's equally theory in a label, a regulation, a syllabus, a competition, a joke, a protocol, an advertisement, a contract, an instruction, a tomb, an address, an account, a chart, an image, a ticket, or in modes of censorship or prohibition. And actually, wouldn't those last two, wouldn't censorship and prohibition be the best possible site for examining the operations of theory? Like, wouldn't that be where we would uh, look? Uh, or, or shouldn't that be the place that one would start? Um, so to describe any one period of architecture as more or less theoretical than another, for example, to think of the 80s and 90s as being more theoretical, is stupid. Um, theory is not an option. It's not something you can have more or less of, since architecture is by definition a theoretical act. It is even philosophy's favorite, even default model of what a theoretical act is. Whenever philosophy wants to say what theoretical act is, it says, it re refers to architecture. More than that, the very word architecture, definitely in quotes, uh, is a theoretical act, if not the theoretical act. Um, which is why, of course, every statement, including the laundry tickets and everything else, has this pathetic defense of the idea of architecture, since that's actually the main act. My main thought here is that architectural theory is a certain effect. It is an opening that releases new potentials. It's a crack that operates as a lens through which to see things differently and thereby acts as an incubator for different kinds of thought. In classical thinking, and I just would love to show an image of the Parthenon since the Parthenon is clearly the star of this symposium. <laughs> so just rising, you know, it's, it's a freshly facelifted head up again and again and again. Um, uh, the Parthenon increasingly a kind of product of Los Angeles in its kind of 
perfect, uh, even the chemist giving it the right suntan, amazing. Um, so the, world, the world's weirdest object, perhaps, um, as this central paradigm for, for a discipline, it's, that's good news, it seems to me. Like imagine that it was not like that, that the Parthenon was sitting up there on the top of the hill, and anybody who went up to see it would have an almost orgasmic feeling of being one with the cosmic vibrations of the universe, to feel literally the harmonies, the mathematical harmonies of the universe passing through your body because you were looking at the perfectly proportioned columns. Um, which of course is the theory of classical architecture, that that should happen. And since it doesn't happen, or at least nobody has reported it happening, and the Parthenon is a building about which people report their experiences, people are not seen collapsing in, in, in orgasmic bliss, quite, quite the opposite. They develop theories, and in fact, the theory of classical architecture inserts itself in the place of the very effect that it describes. And the, the theory is, of course, that, that the Parthenon is not an object in this world, but in an object halfway between this world, which is a second order or even third order Xerox, and the original world, the, the world beyond space and time, uh, of, of the proportions. So literally to encounter the Parthenon is to begin to leave the world behind. It is more beautiful uh, than anything else that you can see. It would be a model for you of, of, of beauty. So there is in classical thinking, and I would suggest this thinking remains the default, think, the, 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 the default uh, setting of the discipline, that architecture makes the environment visible. Whether it be visualizing the invisible harmonic proportions of the cosmos, or uh, the human body, which is not necessarily seen as such until it is figured in the columns, which are at once an image of the cosmos beyond, and a perfected image of your own body, which is itself a second order Xerox, but they clean it up when you look at the column. So the column is literally an, an, a mirror image and an image of a, of a distant cosmos. So, that, so the, the, the theory of classical architecture is that the columns, as it were, vibrate between the physical and the metaphysical, but there's a considerable amount of space there. Um, and this, this is same, the same if it's Luca Ruzia arguing about architecture visualizing the, the new orders of industrialization or more recent theorists discussing the sort of secret patterns which we've been talking about earlier of, of, of post-industrialization, or it be the invisible repetitions and patterns of everyday life. In other words, the classical function of architecture is to make visible the invisible. Making visible in a sense is not so much revelation or exposure as an opening or a gap that offers a kind of construction site that transforms both subject and world. The column, the classical column, is supposed to have the magical singular proportions of the universe, but there is that issue if it's a very tall column and it looks shorter at the top, should I then adjust it? Should it tell the truth? In which case it's not going to look beautiful, or should it lie and look beautiful? So the column is adjusted to me. So the image of the perfection of the universe starts to model itself on my own perceptual relationship to it. So it hangs there as a kind of interface uh, between the mystery uh, uh, of the universe and the mystery uh, uh, of myself. So it's not exposing either myself or the universe, but, but acting as a kind of uh, a screen or interface for this negotiation. With a classical column, the indeterminacy and otherness of our own bodies and of the cosmos are given a singular silhouette. The classical temple represents the possibility of a stable image in the face of multiple instabilities. And here's, of course, a little bit of the complication. Paradoxically, it's so much about the possibility of a stable image that the image is not required to be stable at all. And famously, the Parthenon actually breaks almost all the rules that are supposedly have built up over time with the previous temples, and it's internally inconsistent. So the fact that it doesn't agree with itself is no problem because it's still effectively representing the idea of one singular unchanging image in a very strange way, and I'm sorry the way I'm speaking will definitely be kind of down memory lane um, for the theory gang, but actually, you can only produce an, the effect of a stable image with an image that's not stable. You have to play, you have to vibrate uh, to make this uh, possible. 
So it's not only uh, not, not adjusted for the viewer, but there's no systematic alignment of the proportions between one building or between any building. And in fact, there was no huge discomfort when this whole theory was, as it were, undone, most famously with Claude Perrault's charts, which demonstrated that none of the classical examples agreed with the, each other. There was not the trauma, here is the death of the classical, here is the death of the stable image. The Parthenon was simply not damaged by that. On the contrary, since it stands in, as a representation of the possibility of a stable image, it doesn't, therefore, one doesn't then need a stable image because you just need the possibility of it. So it's the possibility of seeing rather than what you see that is the productive interface. In fact, what you see is not necessarily that important. But the fact that, the that, the, that architecture in the classical imagination, and still, I believe, uh, true of, of all forms of architecture, the fact that it enables us to imagine that we see our world does not mean that architecture itself is seen. And this would be my central point, of course. It's not safe to assume that anyone saw the Parthenon, ever. Um, or at least we should ask ourselves the question, what does it mean to see uh, 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 the Parthenon? An architectural project on the wall, or in a magazine, or in the streets, or on the Acropolis, does not yet imply that it is seen as such. In fact, Sorry to the Canadians. Um, there's no such thing as architecture experienced directly as itself. Uh, architecture is not so much an object that is seen as an object that offers a way of seeing. So in this sense, of course, I'm very tempted and I, I much love McLuhan's 1966 idea of art as anti-environment, what he calls a probe that makes the environment visible, a perceptual probe, that is to say, it it reveals what's in front of you but you didn't see. So the mechanism of seeing, the thing that allows you to see, is itself cannot be seen in the moment of allowing you to see. It sort of slips in to enable something, a trigger to happen. So if it's the case that the role of architecture is to allow you to see your world, and I do, I do think that is the mission of the architect, and I think actually architects are very good at this. Are, are extraordinary, actually, at, at this capacity of allowing people to think that they are seeing their world and therefore feel a sense uh, of, of place within that thing that they think they see. Architecture, if we stay with the McLuhan idea, produces a hesitation in, in the everyday rhythms of perceptual life, a hesitation in which, for the first time, you see the environment, and the environment being, by definition, that which is always around you, like water for a fish, Fish only have a concept of water when you pull them out of the water and they very, very quickly start to theorize. Right? I have a concept, it's called water and I want to get back there. And there, there is some joke that I'm going to get wrong, it's about an old fish kind of swimming past the young fish and saying, how's the water today? And the young fish are going, what? Um, so, so, in this, so if architecture is that which allows you to see which you cannot see because it's right in front of you all the time, the environment, then it's, it, it will itself uh, 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 not, not be seen. If architecture necessarily disappears in making the environment visible, the proposition here is that it's theory that makes architecture itself visible. Theory offers a kind of a flash that triggers the architectural effect. It's a flash without which there would be no effect. Without theory, the Parthenon is not the Parthenon. Um, and when I say the Parthenon, it's as if we're all talking about the same Thing. Architectural theory allows architecture to be momentarily seen. Of course, going back to the classical roots of theory, theora, to see, allows one to see. Architectural theory is, in this sense, not only an architectural act, it is the architectural act. Theory is the flash that allows architecture to be seen as a lingering after image. So that thing which allows you to see the environment itself becomes visible as a result of a kind of flash of theory that for a moment is blinding, but there is an after image within which there is a sense of what architecture is. Or to say it another way around, for architectural theory, architecture is the environment to be exposed and thereby potentially transformed. That is to say, architectural theory is a kind of anti-environment of the anti-environment. It's a sort of anti-environment -anti that, as it were, sets off a chain of, of exposures. 
And this flash of theory starts with the word architecture and I think never really strays away from that word. There is only that word in the beginning, etc. We, for theory to be an agent of vision in this sense does not presuppose clarity. It's not like theory comes along and, oh, I see the light. Um, on the contrary, to see, or in this case to sort of see seeing, to see architecture as that which allows you to see, is precisely to respect the blur, the murkiness, the doubling, the vibrations, the contradictions, the instabilities, the space in which an image could appear. Um, I was going to say as such. Right? The space in which an image could appear has to be a space in which vision, as it were, appears compromised, a kind of proto-visual uh, space. And it's a space in which the, not only can the, will the image appear, but a space from which the image could never detach itself. So the word image itself requires, as it were, uh, these senses of, of the of what retroactively would be thought of as a blurring or murkiness or doubling or vibration and so on. So by the same logic, theory itself, if you buying any of this, is not visible as such. That which enables sight is a blind spot by definition. In the moment of the flash, the eyes tend to close for an instant. So precisely the flash is and even the word flash is about what you, can't, what you don't see. And then the eyes open and something appears, but appears out of a loss of vision, a, a blinding, lit literally a blinding. So the historical question, what happened to theory, becomes the theoretical question of how does theory happen anyway? Like, let's, before, before we start talking about like, what's going on in theory land, what the hell is theory anyway? Like, how does it work? Now, theory is, what I'm saying to you, not very easy to see. Um, firstly, as it's an effect, so it's liminal. Theory does not occupy a place, it's not localized, it's not just in essays, catalogues, books, and so on, but it's also in jokes and labels and awards and protocols and so on, as I was saying before. And in none of those spaces is it complete. There is, as, as it were, not a space of theory or a space filled by theory. For example, this, the location of architectural theory within an architecture school is never clear. It certainly doesn't live in the so-called theory classes. It's dispersed, at the very least, across studio lectures, seminars, exhibitions, websites, syllabus, school labels, essays, texts, tracks, emails, tweets, posters, lunch. You know, definitely. Theory is, if we can say this by definition, deterritorialized, in this sense which doesn't mean it can't be taught. On the contrary, it might be finally the only thing we're really trying to teach in a school of architecture. If there's no architecture without theory, and if the architect is by definition a theorist, the thing that we're trying to teach is that, the theoretical act which allows the use of the word architecture. And anyway, that's what it is to receive a degree in a professional school of architecture, the right to call yourself an architect, right? the right to use that word. So in a sense, you, you do a lot of training here in order to be allowed to speak that word, that one word, uh, that more than religious word. So to teach theory is anyway not so different from teaching design. It's equally inductive. It's equally allergic to methodology. And design would anyway be just the, another word for the desire or the aspiration to the theoretical act, which is, by the way, the whole point of the theory in the morning and design in the afternoon cliche. Um, it's not about separating those two things, but, but producing the illusion that the afternoon, which is, by the way, when the blood sugar level is at its worst, when you're a bit sort of hazy, allows you in your hazy state to be infused with theory from the morning, which you have digested at lunch, hence the important role of lunch in any discussion of architectural theory. So the, so the whole idea that theory happens in the morning and design happens in the afternoon is actually meant to render the afternoon theoretical since theory comes down, as Marx said, down. And that raises really interesting questions about the school being open late at night and which point of that cycle between abstract theory coming down from lecture, going horizontal in seminars to reversing direction in studio. Where in that cycle is like four o'clock in the morning? Are we on the way back towards abstract theory or are we at the maximum? There's actually no evidence that anything significant is produced in schools of architecture 
um, between the hours of 2 and 8 in the morning. But it is uh, very clear that it's not possible to be an architecture student without communi communicating to fellow architecture students or to human beings that you may occasionally meet that something happens during that time. So again, the possibility of being an architect is staged by, by that. Actually, when, 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 when the founder of this school asked the trustees of Columbia University for permission to keep the lights on uh, 24 hours, the trustees refused on the grounds of the uh, mental health of the students. Um, but we won. Uh, <laughs> As a result, we're, we're really prime users of all forms of psychological counseling uh, on campus. Anyway, getting back to the theme. The very word, the very label architect involves this sense of the designer as theorist, and architectural training involves uh, a sustained call for theorization for its own protocols. Schools of architecture teach you how to talk. Drawing is definitely uh, optional, um, or is considered a way of talking and it's back in. That's, hence, I, will, I love this idea that the theory classes will be called drawing classes. But a few more fortune cookie uh, remarks and then we're done. Just as the designer is actually an effect of design, it's certainly not the case that a designer designs. A designer is designed. It's maybe part of what one designs. Something that's designed like any other object. Likewise, theory does not presuppose the figure of a theorist or even that of a group of theorists. That's actually a kind of second order uh, 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 argument. In reverse, self-identified theory doesn't necessarily have a theoretical effect. In other words, if you do think that there was a hell of a lot of theory going on in the 80s, I wouldn't presuppose from that that there was a theoretical effect of that work. In fact, the more insistently somebody refers to themselves as a theorist, um, probably they've left uh, the theoretical effect behind. Theory is not even a mode of thinking or writing, but a certain kind of opening, and I apologize for the repetition, within discourse that produces a particular hesitation and set of potentials. It's the effect of a kind of fertility, if you like, uh, uh, within the discourse. To repeat again, architectural theory is not simply theory about architecture, but is an architectural effect or is an even the very effect of architecture. Returning to the narrative then, the 80s and 90s were not more theoretical, but certainly I think there was the case that there was a kind of a doubling of theory what can be seen in retrospect as a kind of highlighting of the theory effect. And I, I, of course, completely agree with Catherine in the sense of the importance of psychoanalysis as a sort of a reference point. You could say that the 80s and 90s involved a number of us trying to make theory itself visible by concentrating on the structural role of the blind spots in the discourse. A lot of what was going was just basically allowing certain things to be discussed that had been considered not architectural uh, up to that point. Uh, so a great concern for any repressions, occlusions, disavows, blocks, gaps, slippages, repetitions, rifts, fold, cracks, ripples, shearings, vibrations. This was the stuff. Um, this was the launching point always. These were the symptoms on which that work was carried out. Uh, the work was carried out by um, a shockingly small number of people. I mean, a really, really miniature group. I mean, the word group doesn't even work. A kind of pathetically, ridiculously small group, um, who were nevertheless treated as if they had the Ebola virus uh, or something like that. And they were working not only was it a pathetically small group uh, in the more or less uh, protected enclaves of the I Ivy League universities, in which presumably even the Ebola virus wouldn't really present a threat to the human species given the detachment of universities from everyday life. And mainly this very small group of people in these very traditional Spaces operated with very traditional means, like lectures and conferences and essays and journals and exhibition catalogues and books. So really nothing to be upset about. The so-called disappearance of theory, perhaps, was actually a kind of dispersal that was called for by the earlier theoretical work. And again, I would say the question of a prehistory. I think one could discuss the 21st century by, by producing a kind of prehistory of a kind of call for dispersal. The urgencies of theory might be in this dispersal, that is to say, in a continuous relocation and undoing of normative architecture. Believe it or not, running a school of architecture could be treated as a theoretical work. Um, in the age of the in the age of the so-called disappearance of theory, one of the symptoms were schools run by theorists. 
So it's a very odd form of disappearance, it seems to me. Um, that is to say, theorists engineering openings in the conventional protocols of education to produce new kinds of incubation, et cetera, et cetera. That would seem to be theory on steroids as distinct from theory's um, disappearance. There are today, I think, dramatically new horizontal modalities, and I think Beatrice's paper was alluding to this, a, 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 a kind of new, a new way of interaction between people that has transformed research, design, construction, analysis, and publication, and they definitely represent a sort of changed territory or set of territories for the theory effect to be considered. Uh, architectural discourse, I would suggest to you, and by architectural discourse, I mean it all, um, is extraordinarily hierarchical. I defy you to find a less hierarchical discipline. Um, places like the Vatican don't get near architecture for its level of precision and stratification. Um, architectural discourse as a kind of organism is mainly and efficiently devoted to nothing happening at all. It's a pyramid, so it's a kind of an Egyptian work with a very, very small set of voices competing for attention at the top, the sort of stars, and a vast sea of voices below. There are always more than one million students of architecture on the planet, graduating every year, one million, one million, one million. Think about it. And three or four or five men, maybe a woman here, woman there, at the top of this pyramid. And then a series of layers, very precise layers uh, that, of valves that f filter and control the flow, minimizing the upward movement. So each one of the million could dream of being one day at the top of the pyramid. But in a kind of Kino Reeve sense, you have to kind of go through these horrific filters, which are mainly designed to, s to stop you from moving upwards. But I think there has been a very big change. And maybe it's because the Venice Biennale is just around the corner, but the symptom that I am always amazed by and horrified by, and it is a symptom of my own behavior, is how many extraordinarily interesting research projects are carried out by architects and scholars over a long period of time that lead to very, very important and interesting exhibitions with associated publications that are in your hand and then are left in your hotel room because they're a bit too heavy to carry home. So essentially they're kind of peed back into the canals like all of the Prosecco that you have been drinking. And yet, and yet, that's an incredibly serious and interesting work that's going on right across the planet. So I think it is a pyramid, but if you look at the kind of fat part of the pyramid, there is a very, very serious work uh, going on. And the only thing that I think stops a kind of revolution is the lack of attention to it and the refusal to archive it and to allow it to be, as it were, uh, shared, even, the, even, the, even in the form of kind of PDF archive, I think would, would be a transformation. This is, I think, the beginnings of a possible transformation of the field because these more horizontal models um, um, could lead to, a, to an inversion at the speed of the newspaper in other words, the field could find itself as irrelevant as quickly as happened to the newspaper, and why would we imagine otherwise? And certainly, just to say the least of this, and here I uh, so much uh, um, enjoyed Arindan's argument, the institution of the university uh, will clearly radically transform and needs to be relentlessly questioned. It is one of the most likely institutions to go through the newspaper effect of being no longer uh, the source while being respectable and, 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 and honorable. Um, theory, I think, has, has a responsibility in this moment to challenge the institutional protocols that nurture and sustain it, starting, I would say, with the architecture school, with the idea of an architecture school, and then with the university. Knowledge production, if we can use that language, is evolving very rapidly through models of distributed intelligence, open source, and so on. Scholarship itself has been revolutionized more, I think, than, than professional practice, and yet we don't discuss that. Um, but it has been a complete uh, change. The ecology of theory is evolving. There are new opportunities and responsibilities, but also already new orthodoxies to, 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 to question. Uh, I'll give you a couple of symptoms. A description of what is unique about architectural studios, like what it is that we love about the architectural studio, now sounds exactly like scientists' description of the laboratories in which they generate their work, which in turn doesn't sound any different 
from the ways that cities advertise their sort of innovation capacity and their general uh, 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 drive towards creativity and, and so on. Architecture and that's architectural studios in that sense are currently a kind of paradigm uh, of the sort of dominant uh, uh, political economic narratives. And so any idea that the studio is an experimental place from which one could then, as it were, uh, change the world is somewhat ridiculous. On the contrary, the urgency of theory is probably to intervene across the whole landscape, producing hesitations in all the routines, opening up our thoughts in a, re in a restlessly surprising subversion of anything regarded as best practices. At the very least, it seems to me, schools, and especially schools of architecture, need to turn themselves inside out, not in order to blend into the market, and I think there is that um, drive in contemporary university histories, but quite the opposite, to take the, whatever vestiges there are of critical theory out of the refrigerator, in other words, to get that Ebola virus out, out, out. Um, I don't accept the old image of the university as a space of open, experimental thinking versus a world of pragmatic uh, uh, activities um, harnessed to kind of hegemonic narratives uh, about uneven distribution of resources and, and, and so on. Uh, any description of, of the hegemony of the market and so on is, in my opinion, usually a better description of the inside of a university than the outside. Uh, the evidence I would cite for that is the recent uh, uh, magazine articles declaring that now, for example, Stanford accepted only 5% of its admissions. These, for me, are symptoms of the imminent demise of the university as distinct from its uh, uh, strength. These are signs that the university itself is exactly the space without question the space you must be, um, the space so integrated into its outside that there is, a, as it were, an enormous attempt to immigrate to its inside. And it seems to me this is a moment of, of, of great fragility, but also therefore an exciting moment. I think there is a need to construct a future for the university, getting back to this idea of architectural theory in the future, taking advantage of the fragility of the institution. We need, as it were, a theory of uh, and in and out uh, of the university. So just to finish, a theory is by definition critical in the sense of opening up to the other. The task, you know, the critical theory just means to be um, not asleep. It's not much more difficult than that. So the post-critical people, um, I mean, it's just hard to imagine a more embarrassing argument to have made. Um, <laughs> I'm sure I'm wrong. I'm sure there's, there's lurking uh, new forms of idiocy, but that's pretty hard to beat. So the task is not to respond to the urgencies, perceived urgencies, agreed upon urgencies, but actually produce new senses of urgency. I think, by the way, the last paper and the silence in the room as it was presented, you feel the construction of a sense of urgency. You feel it. Um, through unexpected flashes, uh, and it was also a perfect illustration in that sense, in, incomplete uh, uh, images, frustrating images that can never simply be seen or classified, but allow us to see the field through a kind of lingering after image of the wider landscape that rapidly fades away but already incubates new thoughts. You find yourself already with a new thought, not quite sure of what you have seen. So in this sense, a kind of uh, flash theory. Uh, of course, I was thinking of photography, um, in, but it was hard not to think of flash in the military uh, sense as well. But the, the extraordinary scene that you showed of the woman remembering the flash through the kind of slow reconstruction of the fragments of an image, um, better than I could possibly have imagined, communicates the 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 and even the, let's say, forensic direction of the research, that is to say, the look back, the construction of the prehistory before one could discuss what, what uh, happened, seemed to me ex exemplary of, of what, I, what I find truly refreshing in, in the discourse of architecture right now, is despite the pyramid and all that, um, there is bubbling around um, the construction of new senses of urgency. And I think if those, if those are in some way linked um, and, and, and set up a series of exchanges, um, being at the top of the pyramid could become a sort of singularly uninteresting uh, aspiration. Um, 
it would like be to be the newspaper of record in a moment of, of history, whereas Beatrice points out, nobody's reading the newspaper. Thanks. So the, the uh, life is good. Um, because if you're lucky, you have colleagues like Mabel Wilson uh, here at Columbia University. She's a total joy. Great. Thank you, Mark. I think that, uh, <laughs> an amazing act to follow. Um, and, um, <laughs> and I want to say life as a W. I feel like I'm at the end of the advanced studio um, presentation. Um, I, it's wonderful to be in auspicious company um, of both Al and, 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 and um, Mark. So it's late and I'll try to be brief. I mean, I'm hopefully going to keep this under 20 minutes, but I wanted to thank Mark for organizing this event and I think bringing together an exceptional roster of minds to consider um, the future of theory that is an implicit, exactly what you said, it's an implicit part of the discipline. It is what the discipline is. In fact, it's the art of building. Um, but I also want to thank him for producing an unparalleled body of work, writings, um, exhibitions, and the academic milieu of GSAP, um, which has influenced and nurtured new generations of thinkers and makers, um, and ultimately, I think, dislodging long-held positions and dismantling epistemological frameworks to expand the field within which we work, and I think I've certainly found that um, invaluable in, in what I do. So actually, instead of talking about um, urgent um, architectural theory, I thought I would just talk about an urgent matter. Uh, and, and I just want to say WBYA is, is not a radio station, um, but it is a project about broadcasting, um, in fact. Who? Calls forth, um, calls forth a person, a subject of um, an interrogative naming. Builds, designates the act of construction, the human energy necessary for how buildings are made to be in the world. Your indicates who's in possession of the object. Architecture names the direct object the building that when paired with your also implicates the architects whose knowledge of how to build precedes the act of construction by the worker interpolated as the who. We formulated this query, who builds your architecture, to provoke architects and other allied fields to consider the impact of globalization on architecture labor. At public forums and in workshops, we examine and discuss the exploitation of migrant construction workers in many parts of the world. Abu Dhabi, uh, Dubai, Qatar, Sochi, uh, and Beijing um, being the most visible regions where the construction of mega architectural and infrastructural projects have proceeded at a breakneck pace in recent years. But we are also keenly aware that these problems exist right here in the US and on construction sites that have sprouted around New York City under Bloomberg's reign of development. Over the course of the past three years, when we, and that is uh, my collaborators, Katambari Bakshi, Jordan Carver, Beth Stryker, Laura Dixit, and Tiffany Rattray, um, uh, and a host of other uh, contributors to this project. Um, when we have broached this subject to the main professional organizations and to various scopes and scales of practices, it has been met with either silence, evasion, or polite refusal, a blind spot. For those with whom we spoke directly, contractual constraint was cited as to why architects have no power to resolve the issue, which tactically casts the problem outside the purview of the profession. This is precisely the response offered when the UK Guardian recently asked architect Zaha Hadid to comment on the repeated deaths of migrant construction workers in Qatar, where she's been commissioned to design a major stadium project for the FIFA World Cup matches. Her forthright response was, quote, I have nothing to do with the workers, and subsequently transferred the resolution of their plight to the authority of the state. The problem of who builds your architecture has proven to be a polemical query about the nature of the discipline and contemporary architectural practice. How architecture is networked within a global supply chain of construction, one that tethers the architect to construction workers within a whole sort of financial arena 
of uh, uh, surplus capital and debt finance, and what and where is the agency of the architect within this vast compartmentalized system. So first I just want to provide a brief overview of who is building your architecture before delving into what we have learned about how disciplinary and professional practices operate within the web of social, cultural, economic, and political entanglements. Who is building? Urbanization over the past 30 years has been a lucrative terrain for surplus capital production sustained by the internationalization of finance. The property market, David Harvey points out, has absorbed a great deal of surplus capital through new construction. With an excess of capital due to petroleum wealth or in other instances via debt financing, new construction projects have been a vehicle of cross-border economic expansion as well as targeted nation building. Quote, Architecture and urbanism form one element in a complex network of cultural practices that make financial globalization, and by extension its crises, not only visible, but imaginable and therefore possible, end quote, writes my colleague Reinhold Martin. Following Reinhold's observation, architecture, big A, can offer an alluring image of the present future, making it both visible and imaginable. Glass towers signify the future of business. Shopping arcades represent the future of entertainment. World-class museums symbolize the future of culture. American universities exemplify the future of education. Sporting events provide the future of leisure. And a beachfront single-family house can be idealized as your future home. These projects perform as brands that project an image of the host city as a progressive contemporary state that understands the value of robust financial markets, international sporting events, global cultural networks, and environmental stewardship. What we have found on the ground, especially at the sites we've focused on, Abu Dhabi, Qatar, Dubai um, in, uh, in particular, is that these projects are constructed by migrant laborers who are often indebted and forced to work without basic human rights. The reality of how these signature buildings and mega projects come into being stands in direct contradiction to the image these cities attempt to project to the world. In order for capital to, continuously, to continually generate more money that becomes capital investment and so on, it requires a workforce to build these new businesses, commercial, cultural, education, and residential projects. And if none is read readily available, particularly an army of workers thousands strong, then one is drafted from migrant and immigrant populations. And I think the militarization of, of the, the, the descriptions of, 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 of um, migrant workflows, I think, is, is particularly important. So on building sites in places like Sadiat Island and Abu Dhabi and Doha, Qatar, construction workers are being recruited from all parts of the Middle East, Southeast Asia, and Northern Africa. According to Amnesty International, for example, there are over 1.35 million um, foreign nationals working in Qatar, a country home to only 250,000 citizens. Since these migrant workers are not citizens of the nations where they work, they have very few white rights or avenues of recourse to protest, pro uh, to protest poor treatment, even though they have committed to multi-year contracts. Construction workers also face unscrupulous conduct by recruitment firms, subcontractors, and local authorities. Persistent problems with the recruitment process can involve exorbitant fees and false representations of the types of work and compensation. So essentially, you're recruited, you have to pay you know, thousands of dollars uh, in order to even get the job, you, you, have, you go for training, then you arrive and then you find out that's not the job you're actually going to be working on. Nor is, the, nor is it the, the, the compensation that you had been promised. So, I mean, essentially you and potentially your family are trapped because you have to pay back the money. And within some places, with something called the uh, kafala system, you cannot leave without your sponsor's, your sponsor's permission. So migrant workers are also subject to dangerous, at times deadly conditions on job sites. They live in poorly maintained substandard accommodations located in sprawling workers' camps that are often located well outside the city center or near the job site. And I think the worker camp is, again, a kind of um, indication of the militarization um, of the, the process. Because of the challenges posed by jurisdictional differences between the nation states where migrant workers come from and where they end up working, 
Human rights organizations have been challenging the legalities of the current recruitment system found in many parts of the world. The law is clearly the primary and critical area to intervene and to abolish exploited dimensions of the current system. But WBYA also asserts that many of the problems of migrant construction workers are also inherently spatial, urban, and architectural ones. Profiled in a recently released port, report from Amnesty International entitled The Dark Side of Migration, the example of how Kranz Engineering mismanaged their workforce on a campus project outside of Do Doha exemplifies the global circuits that move workers, architects, and engineers, capital and debt, building materials and waste to and from building sites, but in very unequal ways. And so the, the top image is actually the visualization of that. And that's something that WBYA has been trying to do is because the reports obviously are narrative based, the, the images, but what we're actually finding is um, visualizing the sort of spatial dimensions of what's happening is also critically important because then it starts to show the implications of this global, this global system and where people are, are actually positioned and where they move from. So the disjunctive, disjunctive relationship between what Arjun and Potterai has labeled as ethno, media, techno, finance, and ideascapes can all be located within these global cultural flows, where we also find the possibility of critical imaginaries that might initiate new social movements. And this, in fact, is happening, um, attempting to happen certainly on the ground in, in some of these cities where migrant workers are from, but also back, back in their homelands. Um, and so this is not only happening amongst workers, but WBYA argues that it should and could happen amongst architects. Disciplinary and professional practices. So today's post-critical practice attempts to engage the productive potential of new technologies to engage complex systems, including the sociocultural. But instead, what has emerged according to Daniel Barber's salient assessment of post-criticality is a return to autonomous architectural formalism that manages to re-inscribe disciplinary boundaries. The post-critical flaccid deployment of technique to engage complex networks through which architecture operates, for Barber, fails to, in the end, to destabilize architecture's disciplinarity. So in fact, what the introduction of new technologies do is to reorganize in part labor practices within a given profession. Historicizing the challenges of architectural labor since the mid 20th century, Andrew Ross has characterized the introduction of new technologies as prompting two reactions from architects, either proponents of a brave new world of design who buoyantly exclaim that modernizing the field will fully maximize the potential of hitherto underutilized cognitive faculties of the architect, or we receive pronouncements from dour forecasters of architecture's demise who see automa automation as a de-skilling process. So, so these are some of the, the events that we've actually organized. Um, uh, and in fact, I mean, you could say WBYA is sort of a kind of Occupy Institution project. Um, the Viralist Center at, um, on Art and Politics at the New School has hosted two events, uh, uh, and also the Architectural League has been. And so this is really the first time we've actually sort of presented this um, within our so-called home territory. Um, and I should point out, actually, that Brad Samuels of Situ Research that, that they all collaborate with has been um, a part of a couple of the events that we um, that we have organized, in fact, precisely because I think the way in which they're, they're beginning to sort of think about the flows, the context, and the modes of analysis could be useful um, for, for this project. So the disciplinary retreat into an algorithmically produced excess of form, skin, and image might be read as symptomatic of how architecture is now practiced, governed as are most transactions between individuals and institutions by an aversion to economic and legal risks. Hence, contractual obligations and professional liabilities regulate all relationships established between those parties engaged in building architecture. In a typical building project, architects are contractually accountable to the client. The client also enters into a contractual agreement with the contractor who can apportion segments of the building's construction to other contractors. This process transpires at multiple levels so that in the case of migrant construction labor, workers can be sub, 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 subcontracted to provide services during any phase of the building's construction. 
This method also subdivides risk and accountability amongst a legion of contractors in the same manner that securitization distributed risk in the mortgage market. Although, as we now know, securitization didn't eliminate risk, it merely aggregated and spread the vulnerability, enabling catastrophic results. Now, despite this atomization of the building process, architects nonetheless are intimately linked to the, to the workers who construct their projects through the knowledge transfer implicit in the contract document, i.e. the construction drawing. That connection, however, has been so mediated through numerous factors, through legal structures and a lack of direct interaction, that it's become disconnected and abstract to both groups. Hence the declaration, I have nothing to do with the workers. Scrutiny, I'm sorry, there was a, an image that should be here, but scrutinizing more closely how architects work Building Information Modeling, or BIM, facilitates collaborative exchanges between architects, engineers, and contractors to make the design, consulting, and construction process more efficient. Again, echoing the subcontracting process that just divides up the construction process, the design process has also been parcelized into smaller tasks managed by specialized disciplines. And this would include, for example, geotech engineers, facade designers, sustainability experts, accessibility experts, food service consultants, terrorism experts, to name a few. The BIM process and special BIM software enables architects to monitor in real time how changes to their design affect factors such as building material, sourcing, costs, and timing. For all of its up to the minute, up to the nanosecond, down to the millimeter modeling capability, however, the cost of labor is not a factor of the BIM equation. Given that every aspect of design and construction process can be accounted for through BIM modeling, from conceptual design through demolition, perhaps it is this visualization that imparts to the architect agency over the, over the decisions that ultimately do affect how construction workers operate in the field. Through technologies of efficiency, architects can claim responsibility for every stage of the building. And so the argument that the tasks that construct um, the tasks that construct, perform, and perform are outside of the purview of the architect are already being negated through new modes of representation, such as BIM modeling, and the building intelligence facilitated through contemporary practices. WBYA believes that this pressing issue falls under the purview of professional ethics. We believe that as a social justice issue, the problem should be treated and acted upon in the same manner and vigor as issues of environmental concerns have been addressed through the development of sustainability practices over four decades. So you can sort of see within the, the code of ethics for the AIA, the uh, obligations to the environment are quite lengthy, and then the human rights literally are um, quite small. And so what would it mean to in fact expand the, the, the code of um, ethics um, and professional conduct. So co to conclude, through our ongoing dialogue with professionals, activists, and scholars, WBYA also asks, and these are really preliminary, preliminary um, questions from the group um, that we've been wor literally working through um, in workshops. How can these routes of migration be mapped so that the roadblocks can be identified and perhaps removed? How can we imagine new forms of civic spheres and public spaces for the, for, um, for the global citizen? How can the unique position of the architect be used to help guide housing decisions from design to construction to logistics and implementation? How can architects think of site from the beginning of the construction process to the end? For WBYA's advocacy project, it is important to show that the design process forms just one node within a global network of material, intellectual, and labor exchange. It has been decades since the so-called Bilbao effect place architecture as a global medium. Today, our goals are to make the practice of architecture more expansive, to continue the trend, but also to include the workers who build our architecture. Thank you.
Uh, I'm, I'm, feeling, <coughs> I'm feeling pretty good about the W's right now. Um, <laughs> Mark would <was> do that. <laughs> uh, no, it's, it's, a series of extraordinary talks and uh, in a, a really excellent culmination to uh, an extraordinary day. The, um, I'm, I'm going to allow you to all collect your questions while I, while I think through some of my own. I, I, I should confess that I was conscripted into this role recently, um, <laughs> which is to say lightly and urgently. So it's a kind of urgent moderation if you can think about what that might mean. Um, and and this, the question of moderation, of course, has come up in relation to theory constantly. The immoderate excesses of theory of the 80s and 90s against which somehow the last decades... You, sorry. Um, ...have been somehow a corrective against. But so, just to keep uh, moderation and immoderation in mind for all of us. But I'm going to start with three questions to, just to get things going. Um, one for each of the speakers. Uh, you know, the you know, incredible work. The, but what I'm interested in is how the role that you perform in Mengele's Skull, the book with Tom, in which you think through what a forensic aesthetics is, which is performed through rhetorics of articulation and theatricality and forms of representation, I'm interested in what shifts for you when, in this project, in which it doesn't seem to be an exposure of the forensic aesthetics, but an enactment of forensics. And, and so there seems to be not only a shift in modality, let's say, but also something that requires a new theoretical position around forensics. Um, and Mark, when you were talking, I kept having questions and then you would answer them a few seconds later. And <laughs> because this is the mode where you, know, you just can't quite keep up. Um, but of course it calls to mind, as, as you pointed out, McLuhan's invisible environment and, and this great statement he makes, which is, when an ad has become so environmental that it is unperceived, it's now really doing its work. And, and so in your model, Theory is environmental in that sense. It's, um, it's ubiquitous. It's everywhere from clothing to food to yeah. schools. But it's also incredibly precise and interruptive and consequential, kind of in the way Felicity was positioning theory. And, and, and it's so precise and tactical that it's an anti-environment to an anti-environment. Mm -hmm. And, and so one question, just to get started, would be how you reconcile the ubiquity of theory of being everywhere and yet so precise that it can operate recursively to expose architectures, exposing of environment. Um, and Mabel, for you, the question is a little bit about Doha and, and Qatar. The, you probably know this, in the, we were there recently, the QMA, the Qatari Museum Authority, Authority who is responsible for most of the building and most of the hiring of immigrant labor you're describing, refers to their mandate as building a new citizen through museums as a corrective against past generations of Qataris because the exposure to art is somehow going to ennoble you um, and make a new citizen of you. And, and they have such a peculiar constructions of subjectivity, but also an incredible blindness toward all the other forms of not just subjectivity, but uh, uh, forms of, uh, let's say, refused citizenship. And, and, and that extreme condition, let's say, between those workers who are in the service of this strange construction of Qatari identity um, and, uh, and their, the abuses, I'm just wondering how that situation relocates in your project to other countries, cities, locations? When you start looking at America, for example, what are the circuits or economies that you find there among the identity of workers and, and, and how one would, what one has to expose in different locations? It seems like each one would be incredibly and precisely uh, distinct. But, so I'll start there and then open questions to the audience. Yeah. Um. 
Well, thank you. I, I, I think uh, in the kind of 20 or so uh, investigations that we have uh, with forensic architecture, obviously each case poses a, the, the problem differently and also requires a kind of a different understanding of the operation of aesthetics within it. But I would say mm -hmm. that um, in the shift from Mengele's skull, which kind of sees the sort of the forensic aesthetics, as you say, you know, kind of articulating itself in its sort of theatricality and presentation. I would say that um, in this work, you see the aesthetics operating firstly in its most traditional sense, in a kind of pre-Kantian way. Mm -hmm. It is that which uh, relate to the senses, um, and initially not to human senses, but to materials as sensors. All materials, surfaces, are both presence and representation. I mean, what if the 19th century needed a kind of silver salt and you know, dark rooms to see a surface as an image, different technologies allow you to see any surface as registering its being in the world. So the first layer of the forensic aesthetics is the aesthetics of non-human or material aesthetics that is later, obviously, in order to function politically, need to be interpreted uh, need to be debated, need to be presented, and in order to do that, a forum needs to be created. So that's a kind of uh, debt to Latour in that sense, that um, in our sense of forensis, and we, 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 we call it forensis because that's the kind of the, the original Latin term for it. It's that which pertains to the forum, mm. uh, rather than forensics, which kind of was telescoped into like police state operation on individuals. Um, is, is really the kind of, in order to make any claim for and with material for or on behalf of, of the past or in the future, uh, any claim to be heard needs the forum to emerge. So history or forensics necessarily require the construction of spaces. These are the forums, mm -hmm. the assembly around, uh, around the evidence. And, but I would say there's another level to the, f to, to the aesthetics, and that is um, where also kind of our own politics and our own being in the world uh, becomes very important. And this is to aestheticize ourselves. That is to be in the world in a way that is uh, sensitive and sensible to whatever happens around you. And I think that the, the kind of the aesthetics of matter and the aesthetics of the subject, it's kind of being on a state of hypersensibility, hyper-awareness mm -hmm. that registers politics, that registers the kind of that being in the world uh, is very important. So um, maybe I leave it at that. Mm. Uh, that's so much more interesting than what I'm about to say. <laughs> um, I mean, I think that um, I mean, the argument was was a bit uh, was breathless, breathless um, because it's not been figured out. Um, but with a bit more time, the, the interesting thing, of course, about the McLuhan argument that you know that we both love is is that uh, he talks about how anti-environment and environment can swap places and always swap places. So it's a kind of a dance. So it's a bit of an echo of 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 a kind of Tafuri argument about the avant-garde is always eventually normalized and, and, and absorbed, which in his case called for a kind of restless activity that you could never assume that the work was done and so on. I, I, but to say it more slowly, maybe the, there are three levels of theory being identified. One is self-identified theory, like a theory class or a theory statement or something like that. Um, <coughs> Then there is theory writ written written into you, you know you, ubiqu ubiquitously written into all all the elements of uh, of the discourse, and then there is what what I'm referring to as flash theory, which is trying to trigger the relationship between those two things. So, and flash theory, you know, if repeated. I don't know what happens to you if somebody keeps, you know, maybe you get used to it. Um, because the way the perceptual system works anyway is through a kind of flashing. So it's, I think it's a, flash is a relative term. So the thought is that, that, that what's most interesting, that, that this flash effect 
isn't to be found more in self-anointed theory versus not, um, and is is always a kind of a challenge. You know, it's a kind of, uh, um, you know, and it's very classical argument. It produces a sense of insight, but it's momentary insight. Um, so, so I think that part of the way to sort of bring in the McLuhan approach is to sort of see how there can be a flickering launched by the flash that it actually m makes the exchange between environment and anti-environment kind of, um, it, it, it's accepting of that, right? So I think theory did become environmental in the 21st century. So, you know, the, claim, the, the, the claims of theory's demise were actually almost, al almost always being made by theorists. Mm -hmm. Generally uh, tenured uh, faculty members. So it was, you know, it was funny. It has to, you know, it has to be said, you know, it was funny. Um, so just whatever theory, so, but, but the important, thing, important point I suppose is just to say that there is a kind of effect that is, um, for me, the most, it's, it's, the, it's the reason to be interested in this, would be in that effect. I don't. I don't have a uh, developed a vocabulary for it, you know. Yet. Just sorry, I'm, I'm going to let Mabel speak and then let others. But just to pursue this a little more, the as you already you, you also told us, the school is a place of theory. Yeah. It's a it's a place not only in which theory happens, but it's formed through theory, and it's and it's environmentally theoretical in the sense that it is a place in which theory operates us on in the way McLuhan identified, but it's also the place in which we teach theory as you were, as, as it were. The Peggy Camus has this great phrase when she's talking about the demise of theory. She refers to Paul de Man's ebb and flow of theory and says that at some point theory is held in reserve, and she's talking about deconstruction, what mm. it means for deconstruction to be in reserve. It's a question of that economy of the reserve and, and what it does. And so, in a sense, the school is a place in which theory is in reserve. It's, it's ubiquity is a kind of reserve, but it's also reserved for the, let's say, the expertise and particular, particularity of the theory class. And so there are two types of reserve. But, but I guess my question would be what the flash within the school that would expose, <laughs> let's say, the mechanisms of both the operations of theory, the operations of the institution itself, and all of those power mechanisms and hierarchies that you were describing as one of the effects of the discipline, the discourse, and I presume the school. Where, how does that flash occur within the school? I'm not saying you have to answer it, but that, but that would be. Well, no, there are answers. Um off the record, or off? <laughs> I mean, uh, it can have a lot to do with funding. Yeah. It has a lot to do with funding. So, do you direct funds towards the flash? I would say yes, you do. So then, developing a kind of sensitivity to to the un to a to a flash whose consequences are not known. There's kind of a pre-startup mentality. A startup presupposes there's an idea and an angel investor can invest. But the pre-startup is when it's not even clear it's an idea. So it seems to me that's the flash. So you can organize a school to be responsive to those flashes. But to give you another example, um, architects don't tell jokes. <laughs> they don't. Um, and uh, they don't smile. Um, and it seems to me, can, can can you really call yourself a theorist if you don't tell jokes? Like, I mean, just uh, like, like, is, <coughs> is it is it possible? I, and I think the, the, there could be an answer that says no. So uh, a, a very flashy provo provocation would be for a, an architect in the middle of their discourse to to let rip with a killer, you know, a killer joke. Um, it's not going to happen. Um, to be an architecture student is more strict than a Tibetan mountainside. Mm -hmm. I think they tell jokes all the time, actually, the monks. I'm just, I mean, you know, so, so why? why? What's the prohibition about? Um, and it seems to me that, you know, jokes, of course, are a pretty efficient device 
not, ju not just for destabilizing, but for insight. You know, so that's a, you know, that's a simple strategy, you know. You have jokes 101. <laughs> New breed of architects. But such architects would eventually smile, right? Because the jokes were good. So I'm actually not going to answer. <laughs> no, I actually do, do want to make a comment um, to Mark about. Um, I used to teach an architectural. I used to teach architectural theory, and one of the courses was theory, a second theory that was contemporary theory, and we would read you. <laughs> but what I thought was really amazing about that class, which helped me really understand the role of theory, was to precisely look up the etymology of the word right. and see its connection back to theater, right? yeah. and theater as a space of performance that the sort of performance of knowledge in a way, both history as well as is, 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 is comedy. Um, and so it helped me understand the, the notion of Thea or Theo to see is very relevant to this idea of knowing. Like I, you say I see in order to say I yeah. know, I, I know right. what you mean. Um, and so I, you know, that really helped me understand the kind of, uh, the, the operative mode of, of, of theory and theorization. But I want to get back to something, um, Al, and maybe this will actually answer <laughs> your question mark. Um, which is the question of um, the negation. Because I think there's something about how people can claim citizenship and subjectivity, right, and be known, right, and be recognized, right, within, so they're not citizens, they're not seen, they're not known, they're not anyone. And, and I think there's a way in which this idea of the preemptive strike is precisely the eradication of even knowing that that is someone. They don't yet exist, they haven't yet even committed any act, in a way. It's just, pre and I think that there are, are, are some I haven't even said that they're subjects. They're, they're not anyone yet. They're just somebody, in a way. Um, and that's precisely why they can be eradicated. And I think that's precisely how the migrant workers are. They're just they're bodies that are providing energy for the production you know, and, and the, the mobilization and the movement of this kind of global surplus capital that's being erected into these. So the bodies become expendable. I think this is precisely why you know, there have been so many deaths, because they're not recognized as citizens. They're not given the subjectivity, which has its own kind of complicated class, racial um, 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 dimension um, as well. But I think that question of to see and to know is very critical because they're not seen in them. They're unknowns. They don't, you know, their passports are confiscated. They don't have residency passes. So they literally can't be made, made visible within the public sphere of the city of this sort of emerging, right, this, is, this emerging progressive state. So that sort of answers, in that. <laughs> answers right. the question. But in that sense, your project is architectural not because these are workers on building sites, but the exposure of the workers, mm -hmm. right? that, that, that's what makes that project to me an architectural project. That's what we yeah. yeah. broadcasting the yeah. project, the yeah. conditions. Lucia. Start over. Um, so the Ebola-ridden professors uh, were much admired by their students because they were not afraid of difficulty or introspection. So their power was in arguably that they were not afraid to say things that were difficult to understand and not afraid to look at themselves, so therefore to internalize critique. Um, and so, I mean, that's basically my question. But you did point to... Um, so difficulty, I can, under, I can kind of see... I mean, I'm often accused of saying things that people don't understand. Um, so historical work maybe or theory in, within history has taken that over. But introspection, you kind of said, we could, we could ask the question what happened to theory, but maybe that's not the question we want to ask. So is that a form of disappearance of introspection or has it gone somewhere? Uh, I hope not. Uh, I, I thought what I was trying to say was, if you say what happened to theory without asking yourself what is theory, the answers, which could be correct, like I think I offered a series of possible answers, they're really not very interesting answers if, if one didn't ask what theory is. And I think my answer to that question would be different today than it was. In other words, that's a continually evolving... Um, I mean, that's the project for me, to wonder what is architectural theory. My main interest is in the architect as a species, you know, um, from a distance resembling the human, but close up quite different. And, and mainly a, a species that talks and trying to understand what, you know, what is this talk, right? So, so for me, um, uh, 
what I think is at stake in the talk, talking of architects, is it changes. And the pleasure of teaching is, is always to sort of hear what you most believe in and, and, and ask yourself, does it really, does that still work? And I, and I think so, I think the dimension of theory that was of greatest interest to me in the 80s and 90s and so on was what was, let's say, theory number one, like self-identified theory. Um, while, while referring to architecture itself as kind of proto-theory, et cetera, it was really an, an interest in this structuring of arguments in architecture. Um, I, I currently would find that not very interesting. Uh, so I, that, I suppose it doesn't really constitute in, introspection, but it's a kind of, you know, I mean, that would, I hate what I see in the mirror because it's so weird. So I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not sure I'm a fan of introspection. It's really interesting that that came off as an effect. <laughs> um, uh, which of course makes fun of the fact that psychoanalysis was the sort of preferred uh, motif, but um, people who use psychoanalysis as a paradigm for their work seems to me very different from people who are comfortable with psychoanalysis. <laughs> right? Since I have the microphone. I I did raise my hand, though. Is it, is it okay? Mark? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. I'm just, I'm just lining people up. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I want to speak to the forensic architecture. Uh, now, oh, what you call it, you called it, fo what was, it, what did you, form? Oh, oh yes, okay. Oh, but I, you've been using two words that I've been also been using in a different context, and I just wanted to clarify this because, uh, uh, the word representation and presence, which is Bourdieu in some way where he talks about it's possible to be represented but not present, it's possible to be present and not represented. Um, and I was also looking at the floor plan of Auschwitz with, uh, for, in, in a certain sense, to determine that, that relationship. Um, I think what you're doing is quite different, but it was noticing that, of course, it looks like a housing settlement in every respect. Uh, and it, it looks like it was planned as a housing settlement. And, um, and so you could say in some sense, architecture or urbanism of some kind is represented, but in every way that settlement is not present to what's, what it is, what's going on there. And so uh, that's an instance of being present, but uh, represented, but not present. Um, when you impose the, um, sort of architectural analysis onto uh, an urban fabric or, uh, you know, or a, or, a, or a isolated settlement or whatever it is, and begin to use architectural techniques for inquiring into relationships in that, in that. And I'm, I'm wondering whether you're finding in there kind of architecturality that then is uh, given representation, but again, is not present to what's happening. And you, you're, and yet you're saying there is a registration of what's happening in the walls, and that's a kind of, uh, you know, sensible participation of the architecture in the what it means to be present uh, when it's being, you know, uh, being exploded or whatever. So I'm just, a, it's a, I, I, I didn't appreciate any sort of elucidation on that because it, I'm not sure I'm right about you know, the floor, uh, about the plan, the town plan of Auschwitz, either. I think, um, um, I mean, it's a, it, it's a long debate. Um, I, I, I would say what is interesting for me is two instances in, in relation to Auschwitz where what was important in a drawing or in a paper that was written was not what was written or not what was drawn by the ink i.e. the shifting of this figure ground mm -hmm. looking at the ink. And those two instances are quite revealing, I think, between those, the kind of the story hangs. Uh, Irving makes his name. Irving starts as a, as, as, you know, respectable right-wing, not even fascist sort of historian uh, of uh, Hitler. He writes the biography of Hitler. And therefore, when the Stern buys for six million Deutschmarks, the Hitler diaries, mm. when they need to authenticate it, they invite all the sort of the Hitler historians. And all of them are trying to find the authenticity of Hitler's voice in the diaries. Mm. 
uh, and um, finally, embarrassingly, authenticate it. Um, and in this press conference, when they authenticate it, Irving, this is you know somehow a few years because before he becomes a negationist, shouts one thing from the floor, and that is check the ink. Nobody bothered to check the ink. The ink came back as 1953. Um, so <laughs> it's what is called negative evidence. There's no way to bypass that. Uh, it's not about the representation. It's the presence of, of the ink. The second uh, moment where the ink appears is when Robert Jan van Pelt, this absolutely brilliant uh, architectural historian, travels to Auschwitz. This is in the kind of in the end of the sort of Jaruzelski era, and uh, the archives are being opened. And of course, the only archive that the Nazis didn't bother uh, destroying uh, when they retreated in January '45 was the architectural archive. I mean, of course, all the letters and stuff, and when they say kill or not, uh, that was destroyed. But the architectural archive was there. Uh, and then he starts a kind of an analysis of the paper themselves. And it was never, or, or kind of the two most amazing, incri amazingly incriminating moments that he finds were not what is drawn but what is erased from the paper. And there's a moment where kind of a series of plans of a building that was built for another purpose, and this is why it might look like uh, some uh, um, housing, uh, some uh, traditional German, you know, it kind of looked like a barn, uh, because it was not originally built as a crematorium. It's not originally built as a, as a gas room. And he discovers that by a simple act of erasure, a door that was drawn to open towards the inside of the room is erased, that kind of line and a, and a quarter circle. And that line in a quarter circle is drawn opening towards the outside. They, the moment of genocide is registered by that erasure and opening toward the outside, because obviously when their body is inside, you cannot open it in. And um, so, so those, I, I, I think in forensics, you know, I, I, you know, I gave the example before that that table is, uh, effectively, we can look at it as a photograph. I mean, it is registering mm. the proximity, the temperature, the lights, you know, that information exists. We do not always know how to interpret it. Interpretation is always very contradictory. Uh, there's various claims that could be made with and on behalf of through uh, materials. But, but to kind of to understand that at the threshold of detectability, it's exactly when you do not know what you read is right, is that those two things emerge simultaneously. And I thought, Mark, that that was uh, when you were speaking about theory kind of almost desire to disappear as a kind of, as an optics, the optics of theory. Mm. Um, I, was, I was thinking, yes, but there is a moment where, and, and that is a certain kind of threshold, that all of a sudden that the entire optical gestalt is kind of appearing. Mm. Um, and that is at the moment that you mentioned, the moment of its failure, and at the moment where where something enters into visibility, something that wasn't visible enters into it, and then, and then the apparatus is somehow being exposed. I think so. I, I'm, I'm interested in exactly at those moments where you know it's no when you start feeling the spectacles on your nose, mm -hmm. and why is it that you you know that you remember that you wear them, right. um, some, right. something like that. Right. Thank you very much for the presentations. Yeah, one of the very powerful things that I took from your presentation is that I got the sense that you were making, you were saying that um, one can make a case for the relevance of architectural theory by way of um, the aesthetic by, and by way of a kind of insisting upon a dialogue with aesthetics. And um, I think, Mark, I think you sort of seemed to me to be intimating as much as well, using different vocabulary. But, Eyal, I, I guess I would ask you, um, are, is there a particular tradition of aesthetic thought with which you find yourself uh, in dialogue? That's, that's my first question. My second question is, you, you make the very powerful observation that the threshold of the visible could in fact be the condition of the possibility of the threshold of law. 
And I wonder if embedded in that claim is also a, a broader critique of political theory, because it seems to me that it's precisely from political theory that so much really inspiring theoretical research has been done in the last decade, and that could you be also suggesting that it's, it's precisely through architecture, that is to say through aesthetics, that one could also maybe challenge and further the ongoing kind of uh, debates about the um, politics of our time? Um, that was a yes or no question. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I think I think aesthetics is not something that is employed. It's a mode. It's kind of a being in the world. It's it's as, as I said before, on the level, you know, of the subject. Of course, you know, I'm kind of both kind of trying to be under and over the kind of the Kantian kind of uh, idea of aesthetic judgment. Um, this sort of the aestheticizing ourselves to the politics, that's kind of raw skin, that kind of almost erotic kind of sensorium, I think is, um, is, is where I would kind of seek for it, uh, rather than something that I would employ externally. So it's, it possesses us uh, rather than a tool in our hands. Uh, but I'd say it, it's also connected to truth because there's something also precious about it. And uh, especially when one discusses issues of negation. And I think that the kind of, sometimes the way we kind of, we talk about fiction or lie, lying is a construction. Truth simple, simply lingers there. Truth is simple, lie is, a is, is an aesthetic creation. And I think we need to also turn it around and see the enormous labor that the attempt the, of approximation of truth requires on the level of material, on the level of the theater, on the level of, of the construction of fora, right? So I, again, no, to tell the truth or to try to tell the truth, you need to build spaces. The relation between theory or research and intervention is not that I'm going to look at the site and then build a better building in Waziristan or Miransha or something like that. The, the, what is being constructed, perhaps somewhere else, is a forum in which a claim could be made audible or visible. Uh, and, and this is where I think a, a kind of the future-oriented forensics exists. Not only in kind of in analyzing the destruction yet to come, which is also interesting, uh, but in, in, in the fact that in order to look at the past, you need to construct something for the future. You need to build this kind of spectacle, the apparatuses, mm. which are always architectural. Mm. Sorry, I've been taking... Ah, but maybe this will be the last question because nobody runs this place anymore, so <laughs> conferences <laughs> drag on. And I would hate there to be in the future a kind of forensic analysis of why so many people died uh, in this room. <laughs> Mark? I don't want to be the last question. Um, well, because my question for Mabel, I'm, the three talks are really great and my mind hasn't quite yet settled into an articulate question for you, Mabel, but um, uh, architecture, labor, I mean, for every building, you know, you know, there's a whole history of, uh, of, of death and disaster and labor, you know, <laughs> uh, we needed the slaves to make the pyramids and a million and a half people died making the Chinese walls, um, you know, there's still no memorial for, for those lost souls. So there is a traditional history, of course, about architecture and the production of certain attitudes of labor. But I was just very curious, I mean, you know, in your you know, attempt to sort of go from a, you know, still a residual horrific situation and look towards our own, you know, idea of, of, of ethical questions within our own culture, um, can you go further? I mean, you know, it, it seemed great to pick on the AIA which I think we should, but can we go further and sort of ask questions perhaps uh, about architecture and bodies and labor that sort of puts those into the questions of theory, in a, you know, in a, in a, as a fundamental clip? Because, I mean, it's still, you know, it's still like legalistic labor relations questions, right, you know, in some other department. Mm. How, how do we sort of bring that so that this, this connection is not delaminatable all so easily again. 
That's yes. Sort of <laughs> yeah. No. 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 I mean, there's some. There. There, there is a, a question even in, in who builds your architecture about which bodies. Again, which bodies are laboring. I think they're very. You know, in 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 the. Images that I'm showing, these are typically Pakistani, Bangladeshi. I mean, we're, we're talking about like in, in Doha, but also in Abu Dhabi. And, and for me, part of what I'm interested in, in trying to understand through who builds your architecture is why those particular bodies are expendable as, as workers. Um, and other bodies are not, the architect's bodies is not. Is not. I mean, but architects also work, they impart. And, and those bodies who are, are also, you know, the, the construction workers are also knowledgeable. They know their subjects, they're, but I think within the equation of who matters, um, I think there's a way in which they remain invisible and, and unseen. And I think there is something within, um, certainly, what we were trying to understand, which was very surprising when we kept asking people, would you sign a pledge against you know, this, this, this? They would say, no, we're not contractually. We can't. You know, that's not our obligation. And that somehow it was the contract and the professionalization of what they did that was constantly distancing them from what was in fact going on. Uh, and so for me, the, you know, for me there's something both in the practice, but I also think there is something within um, architectural discourse on, as a whole. I mean, one of the projects I I'm, I'm wanna work on next is called Building Race and Nation. And I'm interested in the ways in which this post-enlightened moment of the formation of the United States, slave labor was actually used to build a lot of the, you know, the civic architecture of Washington, D.C. So in one way, there is a kind of aesthetic and an imaginary of what the the new nation state could be and who could be the citizen, the self-conscious subject. Um, but on the other hand, you know, there, there is this technology of the slave body that's obviously being used to build all this stuff and make the city work that remains necessary but also invisible. And, 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 and not in, in, in the register of what matters, not conscious. They, they, there was literally you know, the emerging racial science of the ability of you know, Africans couldn't know. Um, and you also see this in, in the writings of Kant and Hegel and Herder and so forth. You know, so I think there is already something within the, and part of the reason I want to do that project because I want to understand within architectural discourse how does that, you know, sort of get get you know get 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 drawn through architectural discourse. And there are people like Charles Davis who, who are doing this kind of work with Semper and Viola Du. You know, but 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 my own interest is precisely this question of the laboring body building these institutions of democracy. And somehow I see it again, you know, in, in Doha here are these, you know, building these libraries for the citizen and yet they have absolutely no rights. So there's, there's something about the replay of that condition that I'm, I'm in, you know, just genuinely interested in. They're property. So that seems like a good spot to end. Um, I really enjoyed listening to everybody and, and um, to the people that are still in this room. Um, <laughs> psychoanalysis, um, <laughs> for all of these jokes, has a real, uh, could, could offer you some, some help and I think we will, we will pay for the first, uh, you know, six or seven sessions so you can deal with this and never, never, never find yourself in a room like this uh, so late. Um, other than psychoanalysis, alcohol is a, is a, <laughs> yeah. a thoroughly recommended approach and it's uh, also available outside. <laughs> 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 <laughs>